Our distinguished guest, Minister Sherlock, is a Guinea Corps. Erin Gedal Chias is Minlam, a week as a Guala, Sacht and Kuritjert, August Porta Glaku, Laurt Liver Majan, August Mutta Kalura, Nihawan Lahadr Nashunta, Um Yu Firigate Naban, Octusen, Shayu La Diak, the Gnivikishinag Firigin, Inchna, as Kama Kotum de Bliana Bunaha, Quiverinus, and Herinum, Firigin Inchna. I want to just say thank you very much indeed for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm glad to, to have to Sabina and I have an opportunity of participating with you. It, I think, listening to Dominic, that wonderful presentation, it's very valuable not only to see images that uh, will, I hope, change public consciousness, but also to hear uh, from those who, who are active uh, in the field. I think the story that he, that he gave uh, of Amina's story uh, is one that is very, very important. But today, uh, I, have a f uh, I also have uh, been in Geneva on, on a Monday, visiting really mon mon a number of the agencies, beginning with UNCTAD and going through the migration, the Human Rights Commission, a whole series of it different people dealing with issues of international law. Uh, and uh, that was in my mind when I was preparing what I have to say today. But first of all, to make a beginning, uh, it is in a very important day, celebrating as we are, not only International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and the beginning of the 16 days of activism, as I've said in Irish, against gender violence, but also the 10th anniversary. Uh, of the establishment of the Irish Consortium on gender-based violence. It was actually that that encouraged me to reflect on what I was doing in Geneva uh, on Monday and Tuesday. And that is, is that there is a welcome cooperation between agencies of different character and purpose contained, if you like, in the Irish Consortium that could well be repeated at a global level and at, at European level and uh, indeed at international level. The consortium is a truly important, forward-looking and, I think, inspirational platform, bringing together, as I've said, Irish development and humanitarian civil society organisations with Irish aid and the defence forces. I'm glad to see represented here, enabling Ireland, as it were, on behalf of the Irish people to speak clearly with one voice on the imperative of eliminating gender-based violence globally. Now, we've heard uh, already about, the mo about how, if you like, the consortium came to be uh, from the terrible circumstances uh, that prevailed in Darfur, uh, wherein, indeed, it is one of the deepest challenges of our time that in, in the conditions of a refugee camp itself became more dangerous than the society from which people had fled in some circumstances, which is truly horrific. That was a decade ago, but I think the inspiring manner in which the Irish statutory bodies, and I'm glad to see them all represented here, and civil society actors came together to develop a coherent national response to this great outrage. Now, I have to put in a piece here and say that when I reflect on the combination between the civil society, the humanitarian agencies, and state agencies, uh, it is very, very clear that if we are to be real, about the Sustainable Development Goals or about climate change, which we were discussing in Paris, we were already underway. We have to realize that we cannot achieve it within the same model of discrete distances between the different organizations. I spoke in Geneva about the different music that is coming from different silos and how it will not work as well as that, it is, uh, I think Dominic correctly he glanced off it uh, uh, about the reduction in the basic food package available in the camps at the present time, uh, which, which were cut by 50% because of the inadequacy of the funding provided. Yes, it moved from 27 to 13 to, to, to back to 21 again. But the consortium, as I've said 10 years on, is not only still working on such issues, but I said it's exemplary in the kind of combinations and cooperation that would be of great value. Uh, I think I actually took a line from Dominic, he did worry while I was in Geneva as well, he said that we were a far distance from turning uh, our, our 
d our aims in the sustainable development goals uh, into, into sustainable development rights, uh, which is in fact where it has to be in the end. I think that there is a, a critical and fundamental importance to the work of the consortium as we seek to eradicate this most terrible abuse of human rights. And it's an abuse that's occurring uh, across the planet. Gender-based violence, physical, sexual, emotional, or economic, has been recognized as one of the most widespread and persistent violation of the rights of women and girls. And it's a universal outrage, the occurrence of which is not bounded by geography, class, and culture. Yes, it is rooted in many factors, including poverty, conflict, climate change. But I think it's important for us to recognize that it is a learned and imitated behavior. That is what the research tells us. I think while some achievements have been made, violence and coercion are increasing at global level, and in particular in zones of conflict. As I've said, gender violence research tells us that yes, that it is a learned and imitated behavior, the primary sources of such violence may in fact be amplified by other sources which define the form and the method of the violence as it is experienced by a young girl or a woman. And today, more than 20 years after the United Nations General Assembly published their declaration on the elimination of violence against women, one in three women around the world still experience physical or sexual violence. That is a figure which is unacceptable, and it reminds us of the many immediate and long-term challenges which must be overcome if we are to achieve equality and empowerment of women across the world. Here in Ireland, while awareness of the fact and consequences of gender-based and sexual violence has undeniably improved the prevalence of violence against women remains a grave cause for concern. Research conducted in 2005 by the National Crime Council and the Economic and Social Research Institute found that one in seven women in our country have at some time in their lives experienced severe abuse of a physical, sexual, or emotional nature at the hands of a partner or husband. The same survey estimates that 213,000 women in Ireland have been severely abused by somebody close to them. Now, this is not, of course, a uniquely Irish phenomenon. The European Union campaign against domestic violence has shown that 25% of all violent crimes reported in the European Union involve a man assaulting his wife or partner. Now, therefore, I think it is very important to say that moving along the spectrum of what is called undevelopment and development doesn't at all guarantee you that you have in fact faced the challenge of eliminating violence against women. And as members of a global society, we all share a responsibility to stop the destructive cycle of violence against women in all of its many forms. I'm repeating the point that I'm mentioning. Yes, it is associated with poverty, deprivation, and all the desperations that go from it. We're looking at, for example, the people who campaign on, if you like, wanting to learn men and young men about the importance uh, uh, of equality. Very often, it is those who are involved in criminal activities have the best clothes, the best presentation of the self, the most disposable income. In extremely poverty-stricken circumstances. And yes, poverty is, as I said, one form of contributory factor. But at the same time, it is very necessary to realize that very early on in child formation and very early on in education and in changing attitudes uh, to make an intervention. We have, I think, uh, over the past two decades, witnessed a conceptual shift in attitude from a very narrow view of men as perpetrators and women as victims of violence, to one which understands the enormous potential of men and, bi and boys being partners in combating such violence. The title of today's event, Standing Up, Speaking Out, Transforming Men's Attitudes and Behaviours to End Violence Against Women, is a critical one and it allows us an opportunity to reflect on and review both the achievements that have been made and the challenges that remain. Yesterday, coming home, I drove past Liberty Hall's banner, Man Up, and I congratulate SIPTU on putting it up. 
So I think something else that we have to recognize in relation to violence itself is that the urge to dominate is crucial in, where in, in the research when one looks at the different forms of violence. And we have research now that enables us to be far more thoughtful in approaching this issue. It is at the heart of much of the violence perpetrated against women and girls across the globe and therefore it reveals a fundamental imbalance of power between the genders. Oxfam Ireland's work has shown in its research and literature that gender inequality <coughs> is a fundamental element in the gap between the richest and poorest people in the world. And it is of consequence, and again, it is importance of being able to integrate our approaches. They're a planet that has growing inequality, where 80 of the richest people alive on the planet own the same wealth as the poorest 50% seeking to survive on the planet, the deepening inequality creates a circumstance that in fact creates, more, creates further, further dangers. All of these issues hang together. So therefore, state policy, international policy, and policies in specific areas, such as elimination of violence, are part of the same picture. I think this is one of the great challenges facing us all in relation to putting an institutional architecture in place internationally that will be able to deliver, take our normative statements at global level and turn them into strategies that can be ad adopted by national, by national entities and then delivered to the people who matter. We know across the world that women earn less money than men and own less property. In Africa, for instance, while women represent half of the agricultural workforce, they own less than 25% of the land. And even much more important, they are insecure on the land. Their work, for example, their, the, the models, their development often, and often shared by some NGOs, are ones that make women insecure. That is, for example, granting titles which will be available to men, which can in fact be bundled together, that sweep the land from under the women who are working with hoes in the field. Those pub models are still practiced. Some governments have resiled from them, but they're still advanced as some form of way of introducing titulos, which give you collateral, which introduce you to private banking, which is an outrage because it is not starting with what is necessary in relation to making the position of women secure in the land that they are tilling, sharing work, having access to advice, machinery, to be able to control information about seeds and marketing, all of which are essential for the participation of women. I think these models leave women dependent, at risk of losing their livelihoods, vulnerable to poverty, and because they are so, and I agree with Dominic, all the more, therefore, vulnerable to abuse and levels of violence, which are up to five times in the country I've been describing that of the, of, of the Western world. The particular vulnerabilities of women, then, as you have already heard, and girls to violence of abuse in conditions of emergency, has been underscored this year, as we witness the number of refugees and displaced persons reach its highest level figure since first recorded in the 1950s. At the present, the number of displaced people on our planet has passed 60 million people. In several different streams, fleeing different zones of conflict, but also diff different forms of oppression. I think we, we heard the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, whose office I visited on Monday, express its deep concern concerning sexual violence and abuse against women and children transiting Europe, many of whom are forced to travel at night along insecure routes and to spend time in overcrowded reception centres, which lack separate spaces for single women and families with children. And we are tested in Europe at this time in relation to whether our concern will be offering shelter, welcoming these people in conditions of safety, or whether we will shut the door and say it doesn't concern us. We will be judged for this in the future, and correctly so. These are the circumstances, for example, in relation to the insecurity of those who flee desperate circumstances. When I visited the refugee camps in Gambella, during the visit of Sabina and I to Ethiopia last year. 
And I want to take this opportunity of paying tribute to Irish Aid and to pay tribute to the Irish state agencies for what they're assisting through Irish and Jews and pay tribute to the Minister for State who is here with us uh, this morning. I think it's very, very important just for me to say that while I make many criticisms in relation to the economic and social model, that having been at the United Nations in New York recently, in fact, actually, the gender emphasis, the elimination of violence against women and young girls, the emphasis on, on woman, women's empowerment and so forth, that is the crowning jewel of Irish foreign policy at the present time. And in fact, actually, the pro the, what it's doing is innovative, and what it's doing is working, as you will see, and I think Irish NGOs can be proud of that. But I think, uh, as well, that the journey towards equality and the empowerment of women remains a significant one. But if we're to successfully <coughs> engage with it, that journey, the social norms in relation to masculinity, which are a fundamental driver of acts of violence against females, must be challenged. I have an interest in sport and in, in, in relation to soccer. But if you only listened to the debate within that beautiful, the, the, the beautiful game in, way, in which uh, uh, the difficulty that, 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 that uh, same-sex people have within the, the soccer community of coming out in, in, in Europe and, and, and in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. There is the terrible case of the wonderful soccer player who committed suicide under homophobic pressure. It is critical that we continue to work to engage men, particularly young men and boys, in reconceptualizing masculinity. And this, of course, must not be limited to engaging those minority of men who have perpetrated violent acts themselves, but all includes those men who, by their silence, or such acts as accessing sexualized images of women and young girls have created a permissive environment for violence against females. There is a need to reconceptualize sexuality in a way that is informed and not limited to one culture. But also, we must be insistent that no cultural invocation should stand between a woman and any office in any circumstance and her rights. And you know, a practical example of the combination of economic circumstances and what I have just said now is in relation to Mali. I spoke to a senior worker from Mali recently, but in, some time ago, the president of Mali begged not for debt forgiveness for his people, but for debt restructuring, so that in fact he would be able to continue to meet basic necessities in Mali. He was refused. He was told that this was what was agreed and it had to be maintained. Within a few weeks, Al-Qaeda had taken over Timbuktu. And today, I believe the figures suggested to me that FGM reported Mali is somewhere near 80%. So there is a connection between what you allow people to be in global economics, what you do in relation to human rights, what you do in relation to any of the specific agendas, from relieving hunger to, in fact, giving men and women, young boys and young girls, equality. They are connected. And there are consequences in the same way if you reduce the, the food packages and the Turkish border over from Syria, there are clear consequences to what one happens. It all hangs together. One of the reasons I was very anxious to come here was to say that the consortium is an example of bringing the different elements together. And that is the suggested framework that must happen in the new institutional architecture if we are to get to achieving sustainable development goals. And as we review our journey to where we are today, yes, there is hope, there is reason for hope and optimism. We have, I think, very good statements of principle. There is, after all, a robust international normative framework that can underpin our efforts to eliminate gender-based violence. Yes, the United Nations Declaration on the, Ele the Elimination of Violence Against Women is there since 1993 and set out for the first time and in very clear terms how violence against women is both a result of and an obstacle to the achievement of women's equality and it affects all women worldwide. That message, as you have heard from Dominic and as you, we all know, was further emphasized two years later with the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action.
which not only reaffirmed the call for the elimination of all forms of violence against women, but it actually gave clear directions on how it might be achieved. Over the past 20 years, this normative framework has evolved and it now recognises the multiple vulnerabilities to violence which women and girls experience. And it quite clearly defines how sexual and gender-based violence have been, are, and I think can be used as a tool in the oppression of women, men, boys and girls, and the enforcement of gender roles and hierarchies, including through violence against members of the LGBTI community. These gains have been lodged in some major global agreements as well. We have all both referred to, for example, the landmark agreement in New York of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was the culmination of an unprecedented process of public consultation. That was maybe its best part, in a way, and intergovernmental negotiations, and it's appropriate to pay tribute to the work of Irish diplomats at the final stage, in which Ireland had the honour to co-facilitate, together with the permanent representative from Kenya, David Dunham from Ireland, to, uh, the, the negotiation process. So two decades on from Beijing, world leaders have, through the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals, decisively reaffirmed their commitment to achieving gender equality and to the empowerment of all women and girls. It is an agenda which is firmly grounded in human rights and the instruments are there, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDA, and which I think as well is rightly and necessarily ambitious, universal and transformative in nature. That normative framework is there, but we have to take account of the new conditions that have just been described by Dominic and others. And it is with 60 million displaced people, with inadequate funding in relation to some of the interventions that are necessary, rising extremism, and where in fact circumstances have combined together, a return to forms of, if you like, regression in relation to rights. I think that in the Sustainable Development Goals themselves, the 17 goals and the 169 targets, under Goal 5 on gender equality, that explicitly calls for the elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls and the elimination of harmful practices such as child, early and forced marriages and female genital mutilation. And that's a significant step forward from the Millennium Development Goals. The big step forward between the two sets of goals is perhaps their universal appeal in relation to the, to the sustainable development goals. But it's important to underline that the issue of violence against women and girls permeates the entire agenda. For example, the target on the provision of gender sensitive and safe learning environments, that's under goal four on education. That will be central to ensuring that girls and young women can access quality education free from the threat of violence. And it isn't only about being free from violence, it's about the fundamental right to participate. Dominic knows better than I and can tell you better than I the consequences, for example, of HIV in Africa and the burden that was carried asymmetrically by women and particularly by young s females attending school in relation to looking after six si siblings. They gain again another target under goal 11 is on safe cities relating to making urban areas safe for women and children which is very important because the urbanization now taking place in Africa is very often onto a base that has very, very little security. I think it would ensuring that women and girls can access public spaces, <coughs> public transportation without fear of violence. We've seen reports in the papers recently, here, here in Europe and elsewhere, of, of, of women being abused uh, by, uh, by travelling on, on public transport. But in addition as well, the target to end abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against the torture of children will be absolutely vital to realising Goal 16, which deals with peace, justice and inclusive institutions. And inclusive institutions mean so much more than just simply not being threatened. It means to be able to participate with dignity and without shame in all of the institutions that take decisions affecting your life.
So let us be clear. We cannot achieve this ambitious set of goals that I have described for sustainable development if we're not successful in eliminating violence against women and girls. And that is why I, last September I had the privilege of addressing the Summit Dialogue on Global Leaders Meeting on Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment in New York. I remember the, the words stared at me because it was 2030 and I was moved to say we shouldn't have to wait 15 years to eliminate violence against women. It should have happened long ago, and it should have days too, too long. And I repeat that statement again. And here in Ireland, we are taking a leadership role, and Irish foreign policy is in combating violence against women and girls. As I said, it is one of the glowing parts of, a foreign po of our foreign policy. And through the work of Irish aid, in partnerships such as that with the Ugandan-based Raising Voices and the United Nations Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women. And there's the work of many, many Irish NGOs. I also think as well that there are an issue you must bear in mind. <clears throat> if you take the Sustainable Development Goals and you take COP21 in relation to Paris and you look at where this pr the suggested funding is to come from, and if there is an uneasy reliance, if you like, on a very large sector that is to come from the private sector, it is absolutely essential that, in fact, that a human rights dependency, or that a private sector dependency for funding, is addressed through the lens of human rights. Because where the state takes on the obligation of delivering rights and so forth, that is very, very clear. But there is a grave reluctance on the part of the international community to actually push it as a responsibility for transnational corporations to in fact deliver not just suggested possible compliances with human rights, but to have instruments that are enforceable so that you will in fact have compliance with human rights. I needn't delay on it now, but the example, remember, that Mali, after the president had been refused debt, uh, de debt relief, uh, in fact, managed to get very, very, very huge funding without a single condition in relation to the issues that I mentioned in relation to human rights. Earlier this year, indeed you have made reference to it, I was delighted to accept the invitation of, um, of Fonzila Malamba Nguka, the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, to become, as I've said, a champion of the He for She campaign. The global movement has, and I agree with Dominic, the engagement of men and boys at its core. It seeks to bring one half of humanity, of humanity together in support of the other half of humanity. I've often said in many cases as well, when we exclude women, when we don't empower women, we all lose. We all lose in terms of the possibilities of our common humanity as to what we could achieve. As I have often said in Irish, those possibilities that are squandered. I think we need, I think that really the He for She campaign, engaging institutions and organisations, is positioned to make and influence important changes within communities where women are most vulnerable to gender, gender inequality and discrimination. So I will be making my own modest contribution. It's one of the reasons I'm here. Last November, as part of our visit to Africa, Sabine and I had the great honour of visiting the Ufulu Gardens in Malawi, where we learned how members of the consortium are working closely together in combating gender-based violence at a community level. I'm delighted to learn that this initiative in Malawi has been brought to the next level this year, as will be showcased at your event, as you have heard. I am greatly impressed by this work, and I look forward and to more people, including our schools and our community organisations, hearing about it. And actually, what's very important, as well as the normative achievements at the highest level, for people to unrother thought of, unrother sfeder yenum, for people to be able to see what can be done and what can be achieved practically. The eradication of gender-based violence, it remains the great ethical and global challenge of our age. And today is an opportunity to ask ourselves how we as a nation, as part of the European Union, as part of the global community, can play our part in the elimination of gender-based violence here in Ireland and across the world. So I just want to say that these new circumstances which now challenge us are also great opportunities there are opportunities of getting to a place in the expression of our humanity. 
both in terms of law and practice and in feeling, and in defining what our lives together might be. These are glorious opportunities, and I'm quite convinced that talking to people from once they know the story, from once they know, if you like, the kind of story that Dominic and people like him actually tell, or the Mina story of the woman going out at night in the dark for five hours to collect firewood, and also then looking as well how simple, simple pieces of technology simple pieces of technology can change life so fundamentally, both in terms of energy, both in terms of water, and also the importance as well. If we are sincere about our goals, this is where the debate involving people like myself is, we must really seriously take on the issue of technology transfer. We cannot put down in paper a set of obligations, for example, in relation to climate change, without creating the capacity and allowing the capacity for technology to transfer to all of these communities so that it can merge with appropriate and indigenous technology to change the lives of the people most affected. And that means changing changing corporate law perhaps, changing things in relation to allow the benefits of science and technology, if they are actually to be of benefit to a planet that was there for 4.5 billion years, but which was put at risk by, by deadly models. If we are to get to a new place, we will have to make these fundamental changes, and that is for another day. But I just want to say what a privilege it is to be with you here today, and to be able to be part of this conversation. And I wish you success in bringing the results of your deliberations beyond these four walls that have seen such significant scholarship to all of the, throughout this country and throughout the world. And also that, it will, that you will be successful. I so wish you well in your efforts to create a more just and a safer world for all our female citizens. In doing that, we are creating the best future for all humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. And I think by the reaction you've received, you realize just how impactful your words are and how appreciated they are that you and Mrs. Higgins took time to be with us today. Rosamond, on behalf of the consortium, would like to respond to you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Dominic, if you were feeling uncomfortable about <laughs> speaking before the President, <laughs> I certainly am uncomfortable speaking after the President. How do you follow that? Um, it was mentioned in the Malawi video about standing up and for men standing up and inspiring others to follow. I want to thank you for being the man who is standing up and who is inspiring others to follow. Um, not just domestically and nationally, but internationally. Thank you very much as well for your kind words with regards to the consortium. Um, being married to a musician, I loved your comment about um, if we are to be real about the SDGs, that we need a model that it can't be that model with distances and that we can't have music from different silos. Um, I like to think of the consortium as being an orchestra, bringing together the different organisations with different strengths and different perspectives. But rather than tuning up to the first violin or to the first oboe, see I know a lot about these things, <laughs> um, that we are tuning up to the women that we are trying to help, the women who deserve that life of equality. And it is that power and balance, as you mentioned, that is at the heart of everything. Um, I am very inspired by your knowledge and your passion and your compassion um, and your understanding of the issue um, and really it's it is a challenge to everyone uh, as you mentioned not just this isn't just an international issue this is a domestic issue and the fact that we all have a part to play and that we need to make sure that men and boys have the potential to combat violence against women and girls um, coming previously from the private sector, I think it's really important that the private sector is involved, that the private sector is engaged. Um, we do know that technology is needed, that innovation is needed. 
Um, and thank you for linking it all together, for showing us that you know, we're here today to talk about eliminating violence against women and girls, but it links back to inequality, it links back to you know, climate change effects, it links back to so much more. And where we are now at the moment, especially after Paris last week, um, we know that women are in a very vulnerable position during times of conflict. They are fleeing violence as a refugee. You're fleeing one type of violence to maybe enter into another type of violence. And how everyone is now challenged by the impacts and by the effects of last week and how that could end up being so much worse for women and girls caught in the middle. And that their arduous journey um, for the refugees, their arduous journey when they get to here is just the start of another long arduous journey and where we need to open our hearts and open our arms and show our compassion. Thank you once again for your contribution this morning and, um, and really for your understanding and inspiration and we will be watching you avidly and, um, and encouraging many, many others to, to follow your lead as a role model. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.